This episode of Cell and Gene, the podcast, is brought to you in partnership with Thermo Fisher Scientific and Applied Biosystems' new Qualtrack real-time PCR and digital PCR solutions for biopharma. Give your cell and gene therapy development an edge with reliable and accurate qPCR and dPCR workflows backed by a trusted supplier. Explore the complete ecosystem of CGMP-compliant qPCR and dPCR assays master mixes and instruments at thermofisher.com slash qpcr slash biopharma. Hello, listeners, and welcome to this episode of Cell and Gene, the podcast. I'm your host, Aaron Harris, and my very special guest for today's episode is Dr. Carl June. Dr. June is the Richard W. Vague Professor in Immunotherapy in the Department of Pathology and Laboratory Medicine in the University of Pennsylvania's Perlman School of Medicine and Director of the Center for Cellular Immunotherapies in the Abramson Cancer Center and Director of the Parker Institute for Cancer Immunotherapy at Penn. He is an HIV gene therapy pioneer and is often referred to as the father of CAR-T cell therapy and for good reason. In 2012, he helped treat Emily Whitehead, whom we will discuss in just a minute, uh, as the first child to receive CART T cell therapy on an experimental basis. The therapy put Emily's ALL into remission, and since then, there have been three FDA approved uses of these living drugs, which have helped thousands of patients across the globe. Time Magazine included Dr. June in the 2018 Time 100, its annual list of the 100 most influential people in the world. And most recently, the Tribeca Film Festival debuted the documentary of Medicine and Miracles about the journey of Dr. June and a team of doctors, along with Emily Whitehead and her family, who came together on the leading edge of a cancer cure. And so it it is my honor to welcome, to Cell and Gene the podcast, Dr. Carl June. Dr. June, I can't tell you how happy I am to have you on the podcast. Well, thanks very much, Erin. That's really great to, uh, to meet you. Absolutely. So let's jump right in. So the groundwork for immunotherapy began in 2003 with the mapping of the human genome. And you're one of the pioneers of CAR T cell therapy. And a lot has happened since 2003, including the FDA approvals. And we'll unpack that as we, we kind of go on here. But today, especially at Penn, you know, we have world leading researchers who are developing new immunotherapies to treat cancer, but also other diseases that include Parkinson's, Alzheimer's, infectious diseases, you name it. What I really want to talk to you about, though, from, from an immunotherapy perspective, talk to us about what you and your team specifically are currently working on and researching at Penn. Well, uh, well thanks. So, um, you know, at this point, as you mentioned, I mean, we treated Emily Whitehead, the uh, First FDA approval for that was about five years ago in 2017. And so now we have a 10 year perspective since when we treated her, which was 2012. Um, and, um, and the field has had tremendous progress. There's now uh, of commercially approved CAR T cells in the United States, six different indications between um, uh, Kite Gilead and Novartis, and, and it's and then now Bristol Myers mm-hmm. in the last year has had a huge advance with the approval of CAR T cells uh, for myeloma, the most common blood cancer. So it's really a, a, a rapid progress, and um, our, you know my main interest now really is extending it beyond blood cancer. I think there's there are now hundreds of trials around the world. Uh, testing CAR T cells in, in nearly every cancer you could think of. Mm-hmm. And um, and the major scientific uh, challenge right now is, is how we can make these cell therapies that work very well in blood cancer. How can we make them work in uh, solid cancers, right. the, the more common tumors? Okay. Uh, and how, bring us up to speed a little bit on what you're doing in that regard with the work so, for solid tumors. Yeah, so we, you know, the field is, you know, has, as I mentioned, many trials now for various solid cancers, and there's glimmers of hope that, uh, you know, there will be activity. And so far it's been generally disappointed in solid tumors compared to the really 
um, outstanding results in blood cancers. And so research is showing the mechanisms of resistance in solid tumors. Um, and there are glimmers of hope, uh, as I mentioned briefly. So in, for instance, pediatric brain cancer, a paper was published in Nature this year from uh, a group at Stanford. And so in a small number of patients in what is a uniformly lethal brain cancer in, in children, where there's literally really almost no therapy um, once a diagnosis is made, they're now extending uh, the lifespan of these children with CAR T cell infusion. So that's that's promising um, because you know it's a solid tumor and it's in the brain, which is traditionally um, you know difficult to treat with immunotherapy. And um, we've seen and other groups now have reported uh, responses in prostate cancer, uh, the most common cause of uh, cancer in men, and and uh, that. Um, but we've also had toxicity there, uh, and so that's. Um, you know, there's more research that's definitely needed, but um, I would highlight also just two weeks ago or so in the New England Journal of Medicine, a very exciting paper was published from a group in Portland, Oregon, where they used um, uh, T cells to treat a woman with metastatic pancreatic cancer and, and had um, a very um, uh, striking result, uh, you know, so that's that was only two patients and one out of the two responded and, and it's short at this point up to, I think about a nine month follow up, but, but there are glimmers of hope that this issue in solid tumors will be solved. Um, now that many groups around the world are working on this. Right. Right. And the glimmers of hope are what keep you going. So that's great. Um, I want to talk about Emily Whitehead. Uh, so for a little bit of background for our listeners who may not know, uh, when she was just six years old, she was facing a life-threatening recurrence of ALL. And her cancer resisted over 16 months of chemo treatments. Um, and when her parents were told that her cancer had relapsed and that she wouldn't survive. And that's when her parents enrolled her in a clinical trial of the CAR T cell therapy, which at the time was a new immunotherapy treatment. Um, so she was the first child enrolled in your clinical protocol. She was patient one, uh, and her story made national headlines and, and helped focus the public's attention on the potential for cancer immunotherapy to transform it. You know, it's the need to support life-saving cancer immunotherapy research. So what I wanna to talk to you about, the, the treatment of for Emily and others like her, we're talking, you know, 20 years in the making almost, how has CAR T therapy improved in the 10 years since Emily received her treatment? Yeah, that's a really good question. You know, we, um, at the time we treated her, we actually developed the therapy in mice using uh, tumors derived from children with refractory leukemia. Um, but before that, um, you know, the way the FDA works, when you develop a new therapy, you have to first test it in adults. Uh, and so we had treated initially three uh, men with uh, prostate, um, actually with refractory chronic leukemia and, and shown uh, responses in the first three patients. Um, and um, so then we were allowed to treat Emily as the first pediatric patient in 2012. And then it had this you know, remarkable response and uh, in the study at Children's Hospital, we were able to get a complete response rate of 90% uh, as soon as one month after therapy, which is really unheard of in, in, in refractory leukemia patients where they often just live a, a few weeks or short months. Um, so since then, you know, that then went on to an international trial um, when treating Emily. Uh, that, you know, led to FDA approval in August of 2017. Um, and that, uh, you know, what, what we've we found recently now that, as I mentioned, this has spread after her striking results now to many other blood cancers, what we've found just from looking at the um, different uh, CAR T cells that have been approved that more than 15,000 people have now benefited from CAR T cell therapy worldwide, you know, where it's, mm -hmm. You know, they're uh, FDA approved in, in 
the U.S., Canada, Europe, and Japan, for instance. So, so her her treatment sparked major change in, in cancer therapy, and and since then, um, you know, I mentioned and we discussed it's it's working its way into uh, the solid tumors, and and earlier this year, we've shown now that uh, CAR T cells can be used actually um, in, in experimental mouse models, not yet in humans, but for other uh, diseases, for, for instance, uh, to repair uh, cardiac damage. So um, they may well work in where there's a fibrosing component uh, uh, in, involved since, uh, for instance, after cardiac damage and many other wounds, there's a fibrosing uh, component involved by fibroblast. And we found that CAR T cells can uh, uh, provide uh, uh, benefit there by enhancing the healing and promoting regeneration. And there are really several exciting trials now at the University of Pennsylvania and open now at other centers to treat CAR T cells, uh, uh, using them to treat autoimmune diseases, mm -hmm. you know, which really have been refractory to curative therapy. And, and last year in the New England Journal of Medicine, there was a single case report of a a young um, Asian woman uh, who had refractory lupus, an autoimmune disease that's multi, um, multi organ involvement, and a single infusion of CD19 CAR T cells um, led to a remission in her, which is now more than a year in duration, and uh, mm. where she had been refractory to all previous therapies. So, um, you know, so CAR T cells are expanding uh, in their scope in experimental trials now beyond blood cancer. And, you know, we initially began with my colleagues at the University of Pennsylvania, Bruce Levine and Jim Riley, treating HIV mm -hmm. patients, refractory AIDS. And there's there's ongoing work on that where a subset of people with engineered T cells after treatment, um, you know, with chronic HIV infection, they've been able to stop their medication. Mm -hmm. um, so I think it's gonna, we're gonna see cell therapies with T cells, you know, the CAR T cells are just emblematic of the first. There'll be many um, applications throughout, um, you know, medicine in general, I think is, is what this last 10 years have taught us. Sure, sure. And the, uh, that's absolutely wonderful. And then what's what has happened in that time, what continues to happen, with the research and the ongoing work that you and your team do is just remarkable. Um, I do wanna talk a little bit about what you already have, but maybe we can dig in a little bit deeper. Um, the current state of where we are today uh, with clinical trials, additional uh, FDA approved CAR T cell therapies. We talked, you know, certainly blood versus solid, um, but a little bit more about like where we are today. Uh, sure, you know, so, um... Whenever a new technology comes out, there's always some hiccups and um, bottlenecks. And that clearly with CAR T cells is manufacturing capacity in the industry. Mm -hmm. So these are the most complex medicines ever made. You know, they're made individually for each patient. And there was just uh, a few weeks ago in the Wall Street Journal, an article about uh, now in myeloma, you know, which is the most common blood cancer in adults that you know, there's a long waiting list for people to get therapy, even though it's FDA approved. So, so that has to, you know, that just will take time and then the supply chains and so on will, uh, issues that are facing the pharmaceutical industry will be solved. Um, and um, I think the other um, major issue is, is right now they're used, you know, for instance, Emily was triple refractory at the time she was treated. She'd had three different relapses and and so the FDA approval is for people with um you know twice relapsed or primary refractory leukemia there are trials now to try to you know move this up front um and to minimize the amount of chemotherapy that people get and that's i think a very exciting prospect uh, where the immunotherapy could be used um uh rather than as a salvage therapy, which is how it's been first at, you know, approved by the FDA, could it be moved more up front? And, and so that, you know, we have to wait for those trials to occur. Mm -hmm. Sure. 
Um, speaking of Emily, she just celebrated her living 10 years cancer free. Uh, tell us how she's doing and also how people can get involved with the Emily Whitehead Foundation, which is the foundation named in her honor. Yeah, so that was a real, uh, you know, we've had um, you know, opportunity to get to know Emily and her family through many, you know, philanthropic uh, meetings, which has been a joy to see her. She's now 17 years old and, Wonderful. you know, just got her driver's license and is looking towards, um, you know, what colleges will she go to? Really? And, uh, you know, at the time we treated her, you know, she um, was initially six years old and was discharged just after her seventh birthday. So we've seen her grow up into a young woman and um, uh, that that has been really, uh, uh, I think an amazing um, event. And, you know, but the 10 year look back now with, and not just with Emily, but with all the initial patients treated at Children's sure. Hospital, I think we can now say confidently that they're cured um, of the leukemia. We didn't know that initially. Um, and we always wondered maybe because they had always had multiple relapses after chemotherapy and radiation and bone marrow transplants, maybe they would relapse here. But most of the people uh, treated with these CAR T cells for acute leukemia um, have had uh, durable remissions now, which is really uh, exciting and, and pretty much unheard of, you know, for refractory cancer therapy. So, so that's you know, and that we just had a paper in Nature this year that Joost Mellenhorst. Um, led here at the University of Pennsylvania with Stephen Grupp and his team at, at Children's Hospital studying, you know, the long-term survivors of CAR T cells and how the CAR T cells persist in the patient. And it allows us to say that they're actually, that it's a living drug. We, we found, you know, uh, um, in the patients, CAR T cells have, have persisted in, and remain in their circulation in the blood you know, 10 years after a single infusion um, and those cells remain effective. So that's really, a, um, in addition to the clinical results, it, it, the laboratory results are very exciting because they show how these cells can persist and, and that they're, they have been saved. Sure. Maybe she can have you write her a letter of recommendation for her college acceptances. Yeah. <laughs> she, <laughs> that, would be, that would be wonderful. Um, all right, I want to talk a little bit about what is on the horizon, uh, you know, near term without being, you know, futuristic. Um, what's on the what's on the short term for cartel, excuse me, CART T cell therapy? Yeah, well, you know, I mentioned um, uh, when therapies start like this, they're usually, um, I mean, initially at just certain centers and the initial workforce that's trained in how to give them is limited. And that's what's happened here. Uh, bone marrow transplantation started in the early 1980s and it took about 15 years to become available at all, nearly all medical centers, both rural and in you know, major um, cancer centers. And so right now there's this, uh, we need to wait time for the workforce to be trained. You know, medical when most physicians were in medical school, they you know never heard of immunotherapy. They weren't taught anything, and to, and to say nothing of you know the of CAR T cells. So, so now it's spreading. You know, as as people get um, learn about it, the physicians, the clinical teams, nurses, uh, it's all they have to learn about that as well as the patients. So, one of our goals is to spread this out from major medical centers into uh, rural centers. And um, uh, last month, um, in a larger effort, you know, um, we actually uh, went to Costa Rica. And over the last five years, we've worked to open a trial um, of, for pediatric leukemia patients like Emily in Costa Rica. So because uh, right now there are no commercially approved or experimental CAR T cell trials in Central America or South America. So it's, that's, a, that's the major issue now is how to broaden this out um, into the U.S. and the rural areas, but also into countries with low and middle income uh, countries. Okay, good. Um, in doing my research for our conversation, you know, I've watched 
educational videos and inspirational videos. I mean, there's no shortage of information on you and your team to be had uh, for people looking for it. So, uh, you know, but some of them, uh, the parent in me, I could, I could barely get through some of them. And uh, I also had the pleasure of working with uh, Bob Levis, who is another patient of yours. Uh, he's written insightful articles for Cell and Gene. I've had him on the podcast and he's just another example of people who have who are who are living today to tell their story because of of you and your team and i guess so my question for you is you know there's such rewarding and this is all such rewarding work hard work and but people's stories and their situations are often you know they're rife with just struggle and and you know where do we go from here and so what just keeps you what's your motivation what's your inspiration to just keep you going every day well you know you mentioned bob levis i mean yeah. he's one he, he you know he, he was at the end of the rope uh with many many relapses with all the available drugs you know probably eight nine years ago is when we treated no i'm more than actually 10 years ago we treated bob and, and so uh, and a very, very first patient we had treated, who was Bill Ludwig, had already made his funeral arrangements. You know, so we've seen many of these Lazarus cases, you know, from uh, you know older people with leukemia and lymphoma, and then now and then children where their parents had given up or hope because there was no therapy working. So um, you know, it's a huge uh, um, privilege for me to see that. That's what keeps me going and, and my team. I mean, we've seen. And we have pictures of, uh, you know, many of the patients, the uh, pioneers, they were brave. We, we had no idea what would happen when we treated initially Bill Ludwig and, you know, Bob Levis was, was about the top, the uh, first 10 patients we treated. We had no idea what would happen. All we treated was a few mice. Mm -hmm. And then, um, um, and then similarly for, for when Emily Whitehead, I mean, she got very ill. At the time we treated her with cytokine release syndrome, she had a 106 degree fever for three days. Oh my God. She was on multi-organ failure. Um, so we've learned a lot and uh, how to control that. And I'm really grateful for the patients, you know, that have been heroic uh, to volunteer for experimental therapies. As I mentioned, I mean, that initial success with Emily Whitehead now has, has led to 15,000 people being treated with CAR T cells. Right. Right. Wow. It's such inspirational work and, and they're equally as happy for you and your team as you are for them. So I'm sure I speak on their behalf. Um, we've come to kind of the formal uh, conclusion of our, uh, the, the formal end of our podcast, but at the end of every Cell and Gene, the, uh, Cell and Gene, the podcast episode, I ask my guests just a few questions to get to know who they are outside of the office and the lab. And so my first, I have two for you. Uh, everybody else normally gets one, you get two. <laughs> the first one is, uh, what do you like to do during the summertime? What are some of your favorite summertime activities when you're not on Penn's campus? <laughs> well, that's pretty easy. My, uh, you know, I've been um, an avid cyclist, you know, all my adult life and actually as a child as well. So I have so many uh, scars from bicycle accidents, but I enjoy that a lot. Uh, this weekend, I was able to, um, go with some of my friends down to Maryland to ride, you know, we did a hundred mile bike ride. That was, oh, wow. yeah. uh, really, it was, it was wonderful and uh, almost down in West Virginia. So that was where the mountains were gorgeous to get outside on a bicycle and the smell, uh, it just, in order to ride in the mountains. That's, that's my, uh, uh you know, place of, uh, where it just, uh, I, uh, um, clear your head. Yep, I clear my head during long bike rides, and and uh, my wife unfortunately had a significant accident on a bike last year, but where well, she's now getting back on a bike after having her shoulder elbow fixed. Oh boy, well she's getting back on it. That's what counts. Yep. She's she's right back at it. That's great. When I interviewed Bruce Levine for the podcast, he's uh, he also does it. It's not it's a specific form of cycling though, but it seems to run on your team. That seems it to be. Does, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so my last question for you is, um, so you're interviewed extensively by people like me, your 
invited to speak on panels uh, across the globe to provide your insight and you talk to patients and their family families you know regularly and so really my question is so so people ask you questions all the time you're inundated with questions what is the one thing you wish people would ask you and what's the answer to that question yeah i don't know i think um uh you know i've, I've said on a uh, a ted talk that i had you know luck in, is involved in some um, of, of what our team has done. I mean, the right timing. I mean, if you see the movie, and I, I hope the viewers get a chance to see the movie of Medicine and Miracles. It was at Tribeca that you mentioned, you know, mentioned in the um, opening, and that that movie shows many different aspects of just plain luck, the uh, timing of when things happen. Uh, that led, you know, to our being able to infuse Emily and then the fact that she survived it and and now that many other people can benefit. So um, why why did that happen? And I, I wish I knew. Um, you know, when I, I grew up, I didn't have any thought that I would go into medical research. I thought I would be an engineer like my father. Hmm. Interesting. So, um, and then just things like the Vietnam War made and, and other things that I never would have planned on led me into, a, you know, going to medical school. So uh, anyway, um, I think people need to take, um, you know, the younger people starting in their careers, uh, you really have no idea, I think, what you'll end up doing. You know, you need to have patience to find what you want and enjoy to do, what your calling seems to be, and then uh, to really pursue it. And, I just say when I was young, I had no idea that I would end up doing medical research. Well, Dr. June, I think I speak for everyone who's listening to this podcast that we sure are glad you did. So that's wonderful. Um, well, listeners, that brings us to the end of our podcast and this episode featuring Dr. Carl June. Dr. June, this has been a pleasure. Thank you so much for your time and insight today. Uh, well, thanks very much, Erin. It was a, a real pleasure on my side. Bye. Good. Listeners, visit, please visit cellandgene.com to sign up for our newsletter and to read our editorial crafted specifically for professionals just like you. Talk to you soon.